definitely. Uh, so yeah, we're live. Sound looks good. I think sound good. Sound good. Question mark. That's, sound is not God. Good. Question mark. All right. Yeah, we got a few people in chat. Twenty something. Cool. So uh, you're a vegan. Um, I'm I'm not a vegan, but I think veganism is moral, and we both hate ask yourself. So we have stuff in common. Wouldn't I? Wouldn't go so far to say hate. <laughs> I'd say that we've we've had issues in the past. I think that he probably hates me. Uh, um but yeah like I'm, I'm trying to like not stir anything with him at the minute really just because i think that like there's not really that much negativity between with that at, at this point but you know you never know i mean i still don't use name the trait although in my last debate uh, uh uh the guy basically asked us to use it against him um but i just used that it was basically marginal cases because Really, that's what name the trait is in a normal debate because nobody ever uses the formal version. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like that, 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 that's essentially all that I've had. Like, I'm trying to like not attack him anymore. Like in terms of his arguments, and I'm trying to like kind of stay back because it he doesn't respond well. What do you think is wrong with name the trait? Like, because from my perspective, I haven't studied much into it at all. I've just heard it like twice, and it sounds reasonable to me. It's like. Oh, uh, well, I did like, I've actually got like a, basically a series on the <laughs> Um And I did that with like Shadow Starshine. I, I mentioned uh, him to you before. He's like a non-vegan debater. And it was funny because it was like a vegan and a non-vegan kind of teaming up in this point just to kind of basically say that this argument doesn't work. Um, I think name the trait is just a reconfiguration of marginal cases. And I think Ask Yourself kind of admits that. He, he says it's, a, it's the same sort of family, as he calls it. What, what do you mean by um, a reconfiguration of marginal cases? Um, I think that it does exactly the same thing. I think that the only thing that it tries to it, the only thing that it attempts to do that's different is tries to apply it. He tries to apply it to any metaethical position. Um, and he doesn't use like, for example, in marginal cases, they use the concept of morally relevant. Um, and, and moral relevancy is, is something that I think is um, dependent upon mar marginal cases is dependent upon. So if someone comes up and says, I'm an egoist, um, the only thing of value is my own, you know, um, my own interests and its expression. Um, I don't think that any marginal cases is going to come to the conclusion that like you could go like, right, well, why do I, why do you care about like all these different groups? And then, and it's just going to go extrinsic moral value, extrinsic moral value, extrinsic moral value, because everything's, uh, everything's based upon myself on egoism. And that's how everyone functions. Right. And you probably go social contract theory kind of sort of scenario in which case you, you can't really run marginal cases on that person you're going to have to go into meta ethics and challenge the, the egoism um so your objection is that uh name the trade is essentially just picking the most strange cases you can think of and seeing that the fact that they can't account for that is trying to defeat their whole position when really their position might be able to account for most things even if it can't those really strange marginal cases well, I think that it doesn't even need to go that far. Like, I think, like, for example, like this idea of trade equalization, like it doesn't actually function. If you apply it, like, look, if you, like I had a debate with uh, like Brin and, and so on. Uh, I had a debate with Brin on us on uh, Vegan Gains' server as well uh, with Foot Soldier. And uh, trade equalization, it doesn't make any sense in the way it's worded. I haven't seen the new, if he's reworded it again, because he changes name the trade every so often. So he might have reworded it again and he might have fixed the problem. So I'm not sure. Um, but when I was when I was critiquing it, um, the issue with name the trait was this primarily was trade equalization. It was essentially the idea that um, you can take, um, you can turn ontological object A into ontological object B, and um, they, they also must remain as two separate objects. So if you were to turn object A into object B, it would have never been object B. A in the first place, right. it would Leibniz's have all law identity. A. Yeah, Leibniz's law exactly, and that's basically uh, that's that's uh, that's that's what I used against it. He didn't agree, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also they try to say, oh, but it operates in a separate. They try to use modal logic to defend it, um, but then I just said, like you know, that's not how the necessitation law works. You can't you can't just throw out normal logic because it's modal. Like that's not that's that's not how that works. Um, yeah, so that's way, um, way far, way further down the rabbit hole than I've gone. Because I just understand it as like there is a property that makes things moral. And I think it's consciousness. And so if it has consciousness, killing it is immoral. And if it doesn't have consciousness, killing it isn't immoral, which is why it's totally fine to kill plants, but it's immoral to kill animals. But it seems like in that kind of an argument, the name, the trait actually works because it is a particular trait that 
this class of things has that this class of things doesn't have. Oh yeah, yeah, marginal cases and stuff like that. Like those kinds of arguments, they're useful. Like I, I said that, I said that like before. Like I'm not saying that like these arguments are useless, but like if you've got, they're not useful against everyone, uh, and, and in all circumstances, which they kind of use it as like this kind of multi-tool um the try and like oh we'll just rename the trait and then we'll get to the point in which you say something which is like it's this trait blah 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 but it's like if someone says right well actually you know i'm a moral anti-realist and there's no such thing as you know ethics uh, you know or, or like i'm a nihilist or something like that and you run name the trait on them what's the trait there's no such thing as ethics well like <laughs> it, it, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't work it, um, oh, yeah, that makes a lot more sense i totally understand that as a criticism that makes perfect sense yeah, um, and as well, like I think as as um, as well, like I like the idea of consciousness as being the sort of baseline for ethics. I think I agree for the most part. Um, so, like moving on to like our kind of contention, I think um, from what I was, I was watching like obviously I was watching you debate Dr. Alex Malpass. I think it's Malpass, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. And uh, interesting. Like, I was interested, and uh, I think to be honest, we agree on almost everything. Um, you talk about imposition of will a lot and uh, the best of all possible worlds. Um, imposition of will is very, um, very much aligning with my continental roots. <laughs> like uh, I'm a Hegelian. Uh, the idea of talking about will is um, vitally important. And um, but I kind of want to understand what you mean by will and whether we mean the same thing. Um, and also, you did say that when you're in a normative sense, when you're trying to work out what is the best action to take, that we have to refer to the best of all possible worlds. So I'll, just, I'll let you speak now if you want to just say what was it was the, um, what do you mean by will necessarily and, uh, you know, um, why we should refer to the best of all possible worlds? Uh, well, by will, I mean something sort of like desires, but more generally, like if I want something or decide I want to take a specific path, even if I don't necessarily want it, that choice that I make is my will, essentially. I like this piece of ice cream or I like to go play that hard video game or whatever. Those are my wills or what I will to do. So it's just the consciousness plus some kind of choice. Right. Okay. So is that just purely volition then? Yeah, essentially. Okay. We'll get onto that in a second. Uh, and then the next thing, oh, actually, you know, let's just run with that first because the meta ethics, we'll get to the normative aspect in a minute. So this idea of volition being the grounding of ethics, why would you say that someone's ability to choose would be the grounding of ethics? So for example, if someone wanted to kill themselves, um, would you say that in the best of all possible worlds, we should allow them? Yes. Really? Okay. Yeah, I disagree. Um, <laughs> um, and I use the concept of will as well. So I would say that someone can be mistaken in their preferences uh, in respect to their interests. And I would say, like, you know, when you talk about desires, I think that when you look at desire, um, it's not a single desire that characterizes um, the human condition. And it's not a single person's desire for that more, for that, from that point that also characterizes the concept of will, not just an, an individual's will, but the concept of will itself which is um, a Hegelian concept. You've got like the absolute spirit or universal uh, will uh, as it is. So in terms of um, in terms of individualistically, if you look at the sort of an egoist utopia in which everyone kind of does what they want and don't get in each other's way, kind of almost Ayn Randian kind of um, uh, like, uh, what is it? What are the desires of rational men do not contradict one another uh, kind of conclusion, right? Um, I still think that you're not going to be in the best of all possible worlds. Um, one of the the reason I would argue that is essentially because you can be mistaken about what is in your own interests. So a heroin addict, for example, who takes heroin might w want to take heroin, but will be mistaken on their reasons and justifications for taking it. They may, may think that this will bring them happiness whilst this will bring them suffering. And if you can show that, then can you say that they are doing what they are doing their will um and the best person who argues that for this i think one of the easiest people to kind of grasp is um socrates in gorgias and he says uh, is the fool free when he when he does what he wants or is the tyrant free when he does what he wants and the point is is that freedom isn't necessarily uh, at the expression of one's preferences to be purely unrestricted freedom is the expression of rational self-determination um 
and I think that's where me and you would disagree there. I would say that to that what you are, when I was to say, if it is tr truly your will, then you should be able to give me true justified reasons for your action. And, and that was what makes it your will, that you are in possession of it, that you hover, hover over your own existence in a way that you are able to analyze your own existence in a form of self-consciousness and know yourself for what you are in a way that would actually bring you, you happiness. Um, in which case we would move from preferences to interests. You could say, I am wrong. I was wrong for wanting to do that. Um, it wouldn't bring me happiness. And, and I could see the reasons for that. Would you agree or, or disagree with that? Yeah, I disagree. I don't think it's not about happiness. I don't care if you choose happiness. You can choose to kill yourself. You can choose to do lots of heroin. You can choose to cut your arm off, choose whatever you want. I think the choice is individually yours for whatever reason you want, whether it's good or bad, rational or rational. Don't care. You get to decide whatever reasons that are your preferences and you can decide whatever way you want to go with that. That I think is far more moral. I think that, for example, if um, there's some person who wants to take heroin or whatever and you force them not to take heroin, that would be immoral. You would be restricting their will. That would be an involuntary imposition on will, uh, regardless of what they think about it. So I don't think that the rational decisions in any way make a difference or whether or not it's going to make them happy makes a difference or whether or not it's in their interest makes a difference. I think it's all about just the volition, their choice. They get to decide what they want to have occur to them and nothing else matters. What makes a choice your own then? Uh, well, it's just because I'm a determinist, so I think it's purely neurological. I think that your the way your brain processes information to have a preference one way or the other is what makes it yours because it's determined by your brain essentially okay. your nature something like that um in which case can you ever say that you truly uh, i mean one I'm, I'm not a determinist i'll get on to that in a minute <laughs> but if your choices are chosen like your desires are given to you by your nature and the content of your desires are also then given to you by your nature um by that, I mean the object from which you desire, like, you know, like I, I, I want this like cup there, like, you know, uh, and I reach out and grab it and it, it, it becomes mine. I have fulfilled my desire and I feel pleasure. Um, if that's given to you by nature, how can you say that it is yours? Um, and if you, if you, on, like, what makes it, like, I guess I would say that is the action then yours at all? And is it volition? Like, it's not then the restriction of, like, there's no freedom there. Yeah. So there's no way to say that it was yours. It simply occurs and you're an observer. Right. So it's it's only yours in the compatibilist sense. So compatibilism is the position that uh, free will and determinism are not at odds. You can have free will even though you're determined. So uh, even though your neurological state is purely determined by pre existing physical forces, the flexibility of neuro your neurology to do things in the world is what we're going to call that freedom. We're going to call that free will in a sense. And then that is essentially what you have. And so even though your actions are completely determined by pre-existing physical forces, you still have something we call free will, even if it's not. And that is sufficient for what I mean by volition. I, I don't actually care if it's fully free. I don't need libertarian free will. Like an illusion of free will, then, no. But it's just a different definition. It's not like saying there is a freeness there. It's, it's all just definitional of saying that freedom is the thing we feel, even if it's not actually free, we're going to call that thing we feel free. And so... Right. So right. for me, then, it's why totally does that have more support then. Well, because to me, it's that's what it matters in morality. So I I like yeah. certain ideas. I would like to play video games and not grow grow old and have six pack abs and whatever. And if I could like snap my fingers and get those things, that would be the moral thing. And preventing me from getting those things is the immoral thing. The 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 pivoting why, point. Why, why do you want those things? Well, that doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't make a difference. Does it not, does it not? So, well, it does, because if you if you find that, like, for example, you wanted those things because you were, uh, let's say, on a, on a, on, let's say, like, you, you took a drug and it made you have a, an intense craving for apple juice, right? And you, you, you go and you finally find, like, actually, let's just make it, like, culturally re relevant. What was it? You're Harold and Kumar. Uh, you know, you're searching for White Castle. You need those White Castle burgers, right? <sighs> So, you, you, you know, you, you're high as out, you know, you're on this absolute mission for these White Castle burgers. But just as you get to the door, you sober up. So you get you manage to get your burgers 
but you no longer desire them. Um, would you say that you've um, that would be still moral, or uh, as long as the preconditions were also chosen by you, it's perfectly moral. If like if someone forced you to want something against your will, then and that's why you want it, then that would of course be immoral. But as long as you chose them, or if it's part of like a, your natural determination of how you were made through nature or whatever, and it wasn't like pre-programmed by some evil demon, then yeah, it's perfectly fine. So if, if, yeah. as long as it's just your nature and how you grew up and what your desires are and those are the determining factors and what cause you to desire things then that's all you need you can just as long as you I mean, fulfill what, those what, desires. I mean what I, I don't understand is what the difference between nature and the evil demon would necessarily be for one um because they're just both pre pre-programming your action aren't they I mean what's the difference uh well the Evil demon could potentially pre-grow reaction in any way, which means it's it, it's not really your action; it's really its action. It's, it's but then intentionally... you wouldn't know the difference, just the same as you wouldn't know the difference. Oh yeah, you between... wouldn't know the difference, but that's not the point. Is the point is that as long as it's your will isn't being determined by another acting source, another will of some kind. But it is. It's being determined by another. Oh, you mean like it's only as if it has a will of its own, right? So if, right. if your will is being determined by another will, then it's not uh, your will anymore. It's well, determined what's the by difference between the determining. Why does the determining factor of it being another's will versus being a natural process have moral relevancy? Uh, because the moral relevancy of how you gain identity is because you're being developed through some natural process that really doesn't care about you. It has no skin in the game. It's not intentioning you to do anything. And so what makes gives you an identity is that you get a sense of identity, a sense of desire from that purely natural unguided process that doesn't care about you so that well, i mean that is, you'd gain, i mean you'd gain the same identity from the evil demon you know because that's uh, that's you would just not be aware like it's the same it's the same thing no, no, because no, no, that starts with the thing that has the evil demon has an identity already and so you're getting an identity from an already existing identity in the natural case it doesn't have an identity it doesn't have any d desires or wills and you're gaining those things from the natural process which didn't have them so there are new a new function that is gained from the natural process which makes it it's an individual process of you i mean yeah but if you look at it it would still be the same content of your thoughts it would still be the same content of your desires it would be the same stuff going on in your head um you know it, it could be all exactly the same as it is you simply not only could you not tell the difference there there wouldn't be a difference your ability to understand yourself would be equal. The only difference would be is that there was a vested interest in your construction. Um, how does that change your identity? It, no, it changes the morality of your identity. So it's immoral if a being programmed you a specific way without your consent. It would not be immoral for nature to just have created you and not had any direct intention. So that's the right. difference. It's not your identity would still be you. You you're still you. Okay, so would you say that all forms of social conditioning were immoral? Um sort of sort of no. So like social conditioning like when someone tries to teach you stuff, as long as you're voluntarily a part of it then it's totally moral. But if you're being forced if I to do teach it, my children um I don't have any children in case anyone's wondering, but let's say I had children. Let's say I taught my children um not to put forks in plug sockets or knives in plug sockets right and they really wanted to put knives in plug sockets am i wrong uh in the best of all possible worlds yes that would be immoral the only reason you're right. justified in doing that is because if you don't teach them that if you don't impose on them that involuntary imposition of their will they're going to have a much greater involuntary imposition of their will which is the electricity is going to fry their brains pretty pretty nicely so okay so it's you are imposing on their will involuntarily so it is immoral but you're only doing it because there's how a greater that, how will could that possibly be doing them something immoral that they don't know about if it's purely acts of volition how could it what? be that i am imposing upon them how could they if they do not know that they do not want to be electrocuted they might not understand the concept of electricity for example how is it that i can act on behalf of their will if they are ignorant to their own desire not to be electrocuted I'm not sure what you mean. So both, it's still immoral. They don't know that they don't want to be electrocuted. But, but I mean, how is it less immoral? Like how, how is like, for example, how am I acting morally? Like, so if I'm understanding, you're trying to say that um, by saving them, I'm doing something less bad. Yes. Right. Um, and I'm doing something less bad because they have a desire not to die. 
Well, they have a desire not to feel pain. Yeah. Yeah. All, all pain. Yeah. Either way. Um, and that desire, they may be unaware of is what I'm saying. For example, they may be unaware that electricity would harm them. They may be unaware that electricity, uh, that they do not want to feel, uh, that they do not want to die. They, they may not be aware that they, um, uh, of any of the consequences that could be negative of, uh, overall in this scenario. And so how can I say that I'm acting on behalf of their will if they are ignorant to their own desire in this scenario? Well, their desire is just to stick the fork in the socket. Their desire isn't to stick the fork in the socket mm -hmm. and get shocked or and have any consequences. So the consequences are actually contrary to their will, even if they don't know what they are. But how, do they, how, how can I say that if their will is purely volition? What, what do you mean? I don't understand. So if, they, if their will is to purely make a single... So if it's just the, the choices that we make, how can I say that if they have never, they've never um, thought about it, how could I say that their will would be to not be electrocuted? Well, their will is because they can only imagine what they've already imagined. So, so if there's <laughs> something else there that they haven't imagined or have no idea what it's going to be, that can't be a part of their will. So right now their will is just to stick the fork in the socket. Um, now, if they yeah. actually willed to stick so, the fork in the socket and get electrocuted, then it'd be moral to let them do that. But like, let, let's say like, uh, like, it's just to stick the fork in the socket and I stop them. Um, I've done something wrong, as you say, that's in, in, your, in, the, in your ethics. Um, but I've done something right if I stop them at the same time. It's less wrong, right? Yeah, you've, you've done a wrong. You haven't done a right. Why you've done is a wrong. it less wrong? Because you've still it's still an imposition on will. It's just a lesser imposition on will. How is it an imposition on like, for example, um, sorry, why wouldn't letting them do that be the moral thing in your framework since there is yes. no will there to impose? What? So for example, if you, you said that it would be the less so, so the moral thing to do is to let them stick the fork in the socket. That is the moral thing to do. It is yeah, immoral but, to stop them. It's just less immoral than than letting them die. Than right. them die. So, so why, but is, the, why is it why is letting them die immoral if the consequences if you're indifferent to the consequences? Because if they don't know the consequences, then they don't have a position on them. In which case, so, they so you don't need you don't need a will to survive for it to be immoral to kill you. If you have a will to do anything and something stops you from doing that, it's immoral. So you don't need to think you want to live and then have it then die to have it be immoral. So if, if I want to eat cookies and someone kills me, that's immoral because I can no longer eat cookies. I don't actually need to specifically desire to continue to live. So are you making the Kantian point that the preservation of will is the most important fact, is, an implicit, uh, is implicit within all of our wills? So like if I will to do anything, I need to be alive to do anything. Therefore, my self-preservation is a, a matter of reason. I have to be alive here to will it sort of it's more like if i have a will to do something and you kill me then you are Im imposing on my will involuntarily because i don't okay I don't... but then if i have a will to do something um and it kills myself that's fine that's yeah. that's fine that's, that's as that's long fine. as you as long as you choose and it I, and then as... if i have if i have a will but then let's say i have a will to do something and then it kills me accidentally is that also fine? No, that's also immoral, but the immor immorality there is done by nature. So if like, for example, if I want to stick a fork in a socket and I don't want to die, I just don't realize I'm going to die and I get killed by it. That is immoral. That is an involuntary. What if I don't will. know? So if I don't know, I don't want to die. That's irrelevant because my desire itself is propagating towards the future, which implies a, a rational need for self-preservation. What? No. And so, so you have, you should, you should morally have the right to stick the fork in the socket. And if you die after sticking the fork in the socket, you have been immorally harmed, just like if someone killed you. So it is, it is moral for you to stick the fork in the socket. It's, it's immoral for you to be electrocuted against your will. But the immorality there is done by nature. So nature harmed you without your consent, which should be impossible in the best of all possible worlds harmed you without your consent i mean the harm doesn't matter doesn't it because it's the imposition of will you said it was just well your harm, harm is an imposition of will so if it if it electrocutes yeah. you and kills you it is imposed on your will involuntarily which is harm but then doesn't everything in nature impose upon you involuntarily all mm -hmm. consequence no because i like cheesecake cheesecake does not impose him on me involuntarily i am voluntarily imposing cheesecake on myself but there are many so things that do yes cheesecake and let's say but you cannot choose the sensation the cheesecake will bring you 
you can only hope that it will bring you the sensation you desire. Yeah. Right. So, so as long as it's not rotten cheesecake, then it's yeah, then it's, yeah, yeah. But then, then it has it. Like the whole point is, is that like nature itself is, like, is uncontrollable by the will. Like we can control aspects of nature, but we cannot control nature itself. We can control our actions, yet, uh, but we cannot control um, reality. Right. So um, there's many things in reality that we can't. Like I can't fly if I want to, and that's immoral. Um, I can't. Get a six pack by snapping my fingers. That's immoral. Um, if we lived in the best of all possible worlds, we could do that. I could just snap my fingers, get a six pack. I could fly around. I could eat cheesecake and make it taste like blueberries if I wanted to. So in like just like the Matrix, we essentially would just be in the Matrix where we could just make anything do whatever we wanted it to do. So that would be the best of all possible worlds where we did have control over those things. The fact that we don't is horribly immoral. The fact that we are forced into this kind of a world where we can't fly if we want to or where we can get killed and not have any choice in it or have be able to opt out of suffering. Though that those kinds of facts are horribly immoral about this world. I mean, I, I will say I will say like I mean you're a determinist, so when you talk about immoral like outside of human action, uh I, I don't agree. I don't think morality applies to for example, I don't think like uh, a volcano exploding is necessarily immoral. A natural evil, maybe, uh, in terms, and we could probably maybe meet meet somewhere there, um, but not immoral. Um, I guess, I guess what I'd say is, um, it seems to me that when you when you're talking about um, the well, just to clarify well, on that just a little bit more, so um, because of the discoveries in neurology that we don't, there is no free will at all. It's all pretty determined by neuro neurology. If that is the case, if we assume we are purely determined then the word morality shouldn't refer to this mythical idea of uh, free volition stuff because it doesn't exist. It's completely farcical. It's, I think it's logically impossible. So what oh, we no, should... No. Actually, on my, on my lap is a book called uh, Free Will and Continental Philosophy and, uh, by David Rose. A uh, really good book. Uh, basically, my position on morality there, if anyone's interested. And um, I would absolutely disagree with the idea of neurology even nearly informing anything on free will. I think that the concept of uh, free will is epistemically prior to uh, science. I think that science as a form of investigation can met like is require it re requires the notion of free will to function. Um, I would say that the like for example the, the the foundations of science are and and language even require an ethical relationship with the other in which one sees the other as being able to choose act and able to make um uh validate uh verify and falsify each other's behaviors and that is the very basis of deduction and without that we wouldn't have the possibility of um you know like of, of science so when we're trying to apply something like determinism um to uh and, and causation rather to to humanity what we're actually doing is we're making an epistemic flaw because we're trying to we're trying to say that the conclusion is actually prior to the epistemic foundations which allowed us to institutionally come to that conclusion um that would be my, my argument about it i'd say that the problem of free will is uh, actually the problem of free will there, there is no problem there it's just a it's a it's a mistake in language um but you know, like you know, it's fair if people want to disagree. Like you know, we can talk about it at some point. But yeah, um, but just to clarify, so if there is no free will, then what we mean by morality has nothing to do with choice. It's all about different determined processes, and we should use the word more morality to refer to something more like imposition on your will, regardless of whether or not it's free. That's why I don't use. That's why the term morality for me includes natural evils because it's that's more what morality is. I understand. I understand. Yeah, I get. I get why you. I get why. Like uh, it does make sense uh, if you take that position. Like what you're saying. What you're doing is you're, you're making a descriptivist case um, on morality. It's it's. Um, um, but I think, um, one, I would say that like, uh, like, you know, like it, it's not as if you, you, you're doing anything but describing your own emotional states then. Yeah. Uh, sort of that wouldn't, wouldn't be emotional states cause you can have different emotional states from the, the actions. So the actions or the choices would, could have various emotional effects on you. It wouldn't necessarily be the emotional states. But why, why do you act? Uh, you just do, you just, you do neurology. Neurology determines uh, the actions. Is, so in neurology, what is the action urging process in your brain? Uh, neurotransmitters firing. Okay, and that's uh, but you experience it as 
Oh, uh, I don't, most of it you don't experience. Most of it's post hoc. So you don't experience any of it. Emotions well, are I mean, after the fact. People. I mean, like the, the, the evidence for that is shoddy at best. Uh, ironclad, ma vast majority in neurology of experts in neurology, psychology, uh, cognitive yeah, science and philosophy. Doing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty ironclad. Like it's. Like, yeah, but neurologists are, don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to read the brain. For one, like not properly. And then even if we do talk about, let's say, um, the uh, intentional states beginning before conscious processes, uh, like psychological experiments, they, they don't take account of urges. They don't take account of like uh, psychological variations. They don't take about, uh, take account of the, the concept of vetoing. Uh, and even the um, like, even if it is a, a subconscious, um, you know, um, intentional state that is propagated forward, it then doesn't imply... Um, Deter hard determinism anyway so um, um well i'm not sure there's several different things you mentioned there one hard determinism as a metaphysical uh claim about reality isn't what the physicalism about the brain is claiming so it's not making the larger claim that everything is determined just because the brain is determined it's just making the claim that our mental actions are determined by physical processes in the brain regardless of what about ultimate determinism is irrelevant to the position but there's different kinds of tests we can do for that in the brain. One would be like the future prediction test of say pick right or left and we can just look at your brain and know what which one you're going to pick before you do. And that's a pretty good basis based on future testable predictions. But there's a better one, which is we can literally zap your brain and make you do stuff or feel stuff or think stuff just by zapping your brain. And there's nothing you can that, do that's, that's, like, that's like I can make you feel hot by putting you in a hot room. Um, I can make you do something. Like uh, I know that the, the test. Well, well, the, 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 there's there's another one. The third one. There's a third one. Where we, what's that? Touched. I wanted to, I just wanted to finish my point there. There's a third one which we can damage part of your brain and then you, you lose the ability to do that completely. Whatever part of that brain was, like a Phineas Gage case. Yeah, well, I mean, that's fair enough. But all it does is actually show, like, if we look at it, like, it, all it does is show that, like, uh, you can control, um, like, for, one, from what I'm aware, like, we've done a lot of this in rats. Um, like, for example, basically attached a toy car steering wheel to a rat and basically made it run around. Um that really doesn't show whether the rat experiences free will, like has the experience of being in control of themselves or is experiencing an overriding force upon their body. So like whether it's actually able to change their mental state uh, is, is separate. Um, so for example, what I would say you are, and I think you would agree would be um, the, the consciousness, which resides in your body. You're not just simply the, the, the body, um, so if you if if I if you were to let's say have let's say um, brain damage to the point in which you lost consciousness, like your entire current consciousness was destroyed and replaced with a new person who still identified as T jump, uh, that wouldn't be you anymore, yeah. Um, I, I go with the consensus with neurology on that one. So it's literally your brain is you. Um. I don't know. But like, if your brain, if your brain, like the thing is, is that like I think that this is, I think we're going to have a problem with identity one because I don't think your brain is you because if your brain, like, like how long do you think you survive for then? Like about twenty four seconds. Um. Well, so depends on how you define the identity. So if you are just the process that is produced by the brain and the brain is a bunch of particles, as long as the brain is intact, then you exist because you're just the process produced by the brain. So there's no problem of identity there unless you're trying to define identity as specifically just the conscious state that you have, which de de deteriorates every tenth of a millisecond. Yeah, there's like, uh, I think, I think uh, Strawson says that like maybe it's every 24 seconds we'll have like a quite, uh, there's a, there's a point in which something changes in, your, uh, in terms of the energy in your brain as well. Uh, and then, you know, then you've got like, you know, when you go to sleep and you wake up the next day, is that just like a RAM restart, you know, just bang, you know, you're, you're an entirely different consciousness. Um, uh, I, I suppose I would say that, like, obviously, in form of psychological continuity, it, it's not necessarily a problem if identity is something that is separate from your perceptual awareness alone. Um, and it's just not the same, you know, the energy moving through your brain doesn't define who you are. What defines who you are is a linguistic concept which travels through you through time and allows you to have, um, you know, like I was, you know, uh, you know at little earlier i am here now and i will be somewhere else in the future 
um, all of which are the same person because they're held constant by self-awareness, which is, you know, the concept of I, which is linguistically embedded and applied to this form, which then goes and acts in the world. Um, in which case, there's no real problem there, like in terms of like, um, like psychological continuity. Um, of course, what leads with a kind of, what needs us to ask is like, are you then purely acting upon um, the... It's not about then the expression of it's not is it about the expression of cur current desire or is it the or can you for example have a desire for something um like would you associate with desires in the past as well would you say that like those are also your desires or is it just anything immediate it seems like your your idea of volition like your idea of freedom is pure preference uh, and I think this is where we kind of disagree. I would say that uh, freedom is self-determination. I think that to be unrestricted is not freedom. To be purely able to get whatever you want at any time you want, um, whenever you want it, is not freedom. Um, that's to be determined by your like nature, by your environment, um, by the thoughtless processes which govern um, the, the desire propagation, or even... Um, the lack of self-governing uh, contemplation you have over yourself. You may allow your desires to run free. Um, I would say that volition, like, you know, Sartre, we are condemned to be free in that respect. Yeah, fair enough. I understand what you're saying. Like, you cannot get past your own volitional state in the fact that it is you, quote unquote, linguistically acting. Of course, it, I think that we have a very different um understanding of that i would say that it is actually you who are acting and you would say that it's a bodily process which we just describe as you um i don't think ethics is actually a well-fitting concept for this i think you'd be better off describing it in physics uh or or um or in another science than than philosophy i don't think a philosophical concept actually works in this if humans were to behave were to be physical objects of investigation i think the application of uh of uh, philosophy in this respect of ethics is unfitting and i think what would be make a better uh, an explanation for this uh, and i would argue that that, I, that it's actually the other way around that causation is unfitting but long story short why unrestricted freedom is not freedom i would say that you can intend to do something uh, and not intend for the results or not know that the ins or intend for or that there is an implicit intention in your actions that you are unaware of. So, uh, in other words, uh, Anne Rand says, a desire, was it a whim, is a desire in which the desirer does not care to know the cause. I would say that within our very nature, there is um, an implicit goal in mind, a telos. I would say that, like, and it uni uni unites all desire. I would say that all desire holds within it a goal to achieve a good life, happiness, uh, pleasure, avoid pain, all of these are built in to our nature, that we, by nature, have been given um, a set criteria of what makes, of what we want and what we do not want, um, and what is good for us and what is not good for us. Um, what I would say that we can do then is we can analyze whether our desires actually create the world in which we wanted to live in in the first place and whether we could be aware that what we wanted was wrong against what we what we actually wanted to bring around you talk about the best of all possible worlds can we not be mistaken about what that looks like so if i was to say to you what is the best of all possible worlds what would you say a world without involuntary ambition of will where everyone gets to define their own nature of reality okay that's very abstract yeah well, what is yes, it it's the best like? of all possible worlds. Like what? So, or do you so mean like, like? So it's like, and it's abstract, though, isn't it? Like, so everyone gets to do everything that they want to do uh, at all times, right? Well, no. So yeah. you can't do everything you want to do. Like, you can't impose on someone else's will without their consent, no matter how much you want to. It's only everyone gets their own universe. You can do whatever you want with your universe. And de describe the world, the the rules, however you want, laws of physics or whatever, and then you can't. But you can never force anyone else to do anything they don't consent to. Why? Because that's immoral. Why is it immoral? Because it's involuntary position of will. That Why is that immoral? Because it would move us away from the best of all possible worlds. Circular. 
uh, all reasoning, the Grippus trilemma, all reasoning rests on circular reasoning that rests on dogmatism. If I'm saying it's true by definition, that would be circular, but the circular just by giving a definition is a tautology. It's not circular. So it'd, be, it'd only be circular reason if I'm saying it's... No, 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 what, what, what the thing is, is an unjustified tautology. Like, like tautology is a circular, is circular, but true. No, no so it's the difference example, between... It's the difference between problem. it's the difference between the synthetic and the analytic distinction. If I'm saying it's analytically true, then it's circular. If it's only true by definition mm -hmm. because I'm using the definitions, then yes. Why is it you, you would need to show what, that it was that it could not be the that it would be irrational for it. No, 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 it no, no. I, I can just say it's, it must be the case. You I can have to show no, that I don't, it must no, be I don't. The case. No, I can say it's yes. synthetically true. I can say it's describing. No, with, so no, no, no I don't. No, I don't. You, you're, you're misunderstanding yes. how the truth works. You it's, cannot. You cannot. You cannot. Like for example, I cannot go. Um, the sky is green uh, and that'll be synthetic, right? But let's say I was to say like all, uh, I don't know. Uh, let's, uh, so you'll say the best of all possible worlds is the greatest expression of the will. Uh, and right. So if I was to say, if I was just to create a definition, like um, uh, the greatest happiness is um, whatever I want it to be. Uh, or like the greatest happiness is when I am happy. Um uh, well, what makes it the greatest? Uh, well, what makes what makes it like you know like what makes the greatest happiness the greatest happiness? Because I am happy. And then I was to say like, well, you say well, well what makes you happy? Uh, the greatest happiness, and you just go because it's the greatest happiness. That 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 that's asserted. It's asserted without. No, no, you're you're confusing uh, analytic and synthetic truths here. So if you ask me, what yeah, do I, I mean? Know, I know. Well, analytic truth is true by definition. It right. is true because it, it must be the case. Right, right. So, like so, triangle must so again, have three sides. let me finish the statement this time. So Sorry. again, I'm saying it's true because it refers to something in the world like a platonic object. If the platonic object of our platonic morality is true, then this definition, if it corresponds to that thing, is true. I can give you how, what I mean by these terms, but it's true because it refers to the object in the world, which makes it a synthetic truth. And the definitions don't matter. All the definitions are just describing this thing. So it's not true because I'm using the definition. It's true because it refers to a thing in the world. Okay, so you're arguing that there is an ontologically objective fact that is that yes. the best of all possible worlds, right? And how do I identify that fact? Uh, no idea. We're still working on it. Like the best we got how right now is... How you identify that fact? Yeah, so the best we got right now is moral intuition, moral progress, looking at those things. We can draw a line dotted graph, see if where does it lead and see if into it that this thing might be there. So that's an assertion. No, I don't think so. Like it's just, but it's, just I mean, it's an intuition without grounding. So it's a, a like, it, unless you're trying to say that they're like, for example, it sounds like you're trying to kind of do a GE more good is good. No, absolutely not. So again, this is exactly like science. Like we see stuff fall. We see it fall at a consistent rate. Let's infer. Well, based on this, what is, what is it causing stuff to fall? It's well, I have no idea, but here's the rate at which it falls. F equals MA. Um, what is ontologically, what is the stuff that causes it to fall like Newton? I have no idea. I'm just looking at the evidence, trying to create a principle that describes what we're seeing now. The, so I don't actually say anything about the ontology of what morality is, but I can tell you if it is a thing that in the world, like a platonic object or whatever, then the truth maker isn't the words. I'm not the words I'm describing at the F equals MA. That's all circular because there's an equal sign there. It's just this word means this word. So if I say immoral is involuntary imposition of will, it's the exact same thing as saying F equals MA. And so if you ask, what do I mean by MA? Well, well, I, I mean F. And so obviously that's going to be circular, but that's not what makes it true. The truth making well, is the I, fact I mean, that- Actually, it would be, I mean, physics is a, is a, as, as extensive. So you'd, you'd point towards the, you'd be like, I mean that- Yes. Momentum, yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. So I, I'm doing I, the same I, thing with morality. So when I say something yeah. is moral, I'm that. That thing is the moral thing. And what I'm what referring to is like moral intuition and moral progress are the two what evidence would, what would you point to? So if I was to say momentum, I would point to an object moving. <laughs> what would you point to with morality? Moral intuition and moral progress. Those are the two evidences. So moral intuition, that can be a sense. That's just a sense, yeah? Yes. So it's like my, my seeing... Like, for example, if I see an object move, but there was no object there, has the object actually existed? Like if I hallucinate? No, that's a delusion. Okay. And why couldn't we have a mass, on mass delusion about morality? We could. That's definitely a possibility. Okay. So again, like there is a 50-50 chance that it could be really just as a construction of culture language.
there's um, lots of different possibilities of what it could be. There's many different interpretations and philosophy about the solution to objective morality. Mine is just a hypothesis cool. like any other. Just like in quantum mechanics, you have like 10 different interpretations of physics. It's not like, which it's not like we have a 50-50 on any of them. They're all just guesses. So none of them well, no, are the right. Is that those fields have like, met, uh, have like ontological foundation in terms of where you can point towards at least a physical reality which has uh, metaphysical grounding. No, they don't. Physics doesn't make any kinds of assertions about that at all. So, I mean, the, I mean, for physics to even function, it has to rely upon the the, the concept no, that a physical exists. No, it doesn't. It's not a, no, it's not a part I mean, of physics. Okay, okay. So you don't think that the so you think that physics could function exactly the same if there was no such thing as a physical world? Yeah, that's that's no. the brain in the vat argument. Uh, yeah, but brain in the vat would imply that there is a physical no, reality. No, it, the brain in the vat argument is a reality implying laws of physics in like a no, kind of computer no, it simulation. The, the, it would be like there are laws, but they're describing something different. From what we are aware of, let's like no, 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 all no. right. That's, that's all not of, all that's of, not the um, point. The point of the brain. Wait, 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 wait. So the point of the brain and the vat argument is a class of arguments that show everything we know about reality could be wrong, like Descartes' demon. So in Descartes' yeah. demon, we have a perspective yeah, of Descartes reality. Was wrong anyway. <laughs> Descartes was not wrong about that. Descartes was wrong about idealism. But the point is, is that everything we know could be wrong, and it only works in the sense that we perceive it to work. So it's possible physics isn't describing anything it's just an imaginary construct in our heads and that there is no physical world idealism is true that's one of the things idealists argue is that physics works perfectly fine even though there is no physical world it's just idealism and stuff there's no yeah, contradiction yeah, like, there what i mean is that like what what physics is describing is implied within the meta within the metaphysical like there is an epistemological foundation for what physics is necessarily able to function as as in that we are experiencing a physical world that whether it is physical or not like in terms of like ultimately like the physical reality is indifferent to how physics functions fair enough but in terms of like how the 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 necessary conditions from which physics is reliant physics would not function the way it does as a deductive field if if it was shown that uh physical objects did not exist uh, in the way in which we are experiencing them experiencing them the, the 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 field would actually have to to modify and change um which which does happen and, and institutions do modify and they do grow and you see like you know modifications from like alchemy to science for example and you know like the improvements of like various fields but like in terms of the foundations like the metaphysical foundations for physics it they're, they're implicit within the no or and even the logical so, so foundations there, for physics in terms of how our reasoning functions no when you're talking about no, Descartes there, so that was the like, same thing you said earlier about that free will was the underpinnings of uh science and those things that's absolutely false like science makes no, no metaphysical no. ontological claims about reality at all it just assumes them how would we choose like for example how would we uh, act within a field right like uh like like remember so you're actually gonna see if I can get you a quote. I'll get you a nice quote. Um Let's see if I actually took it down. Dude, you could just go through it by memory. I'll I can probably yeah, uh, well, it, it's it's not that big of a deal. But the the the, the I was just I was I think I was going to quote Heidegger. But the 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 point of uh, I guess what I was trying to get is like the, the, what is called the fittingness of the concept. I think Heidegger calls it, and it's it's a it's essentially like the epistemological um, like science cannot assert its own foundation, right? Like science it's not doesn't care about the foundation. That's the point. The metaphysics is irrelevant to science. No, because mm, yeah no yeah <laughs> like look at it like this right like like right can science assert that deduction is actually the, the deductive method the scientific method is true without having to give an argument of why we should be deductive science doesn't use a deduction it uses induction well it uses both and it uses it uses deduction in terms of uh in terms of peer review and, and so on and it uses induction in terms of uh uh, in terms of like uh, you know the sun rising and it and it kind of bases its conclusions off perceptual reason and then moves on, but it doesn't use induction purely, at least not in my experience of science. You mean like, by peer review, people look at it and see if the premises, the conclusion follows from the premises. Is that what you mean by they're using deduction? I, I would say that the conclusion follows from the premises is deduction, and that the conclusion presupposes is is induction. The conclusion being presupposes induction. Uh, conclusion being well, that wouldn't be induction that's presupposition no induction is the conclusion being attempted to be proven uh, and by, and then you'll search for the evidence deduction is finding evidence and then attempting to to come to a conclusion 
um, but that would be post hoc reasoning versus uh, future predictions. So, so deduction is where the, the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises, and induction is where it's just probably follows yeah. from the premises. So, yeah, but like in terms of method, induction would be to um, stipulate a conclusion and attempt to find evidence, and deduction would be uh, find evidence and then stipulate a conclusion. All science is is look at evidence and then stipulate a conclusion. So, so yeah, all I would call that deductive, and and, that, and Karl Popper would also call that deductive. That's what I'm kind of going off. Okay, so by deductive, I'm just using the strict philosophical sense of the conclusion necess necessar necessarily follows from the premises. So in science, it's always you look at evidence, then try and make yeah. a conclusion for sure. Yeah, which is what I would say. That's how science, like that, I would say science is trying to do that when it's using the scientific method. It's right, looking right. at evidence and sure. then looking at the conclusion. Definitely. Um, in, which case, in which case, I'd say that deduction only works through the ethical relationship between individuals. Ethic, ethical relationship between individuals like uh, there could be no individuals if, except me in the universe and i could still use science no your own reasoning would be on it you'll be unable to verify or falsify your own reason don't need to i don't need absolute you, certainty you could look at you could see like uh, even your ability to conceptualize reality would be um would be impossible i would say that like for example what no. holds concept like for example um so so, know, so, like, so let's, let's do you know anything about do you know anything about um wittgenstein uh some like his his book the tractus philosophical the whatever the tractus, yeah what about the philosophical investigations have you ever yeah this is one of his other ones what about yeah that was like that was the one after right so the tractatus is like science is like for like absolutely like everything is an atomistic fact um the philosophical investigations is essentially like wittgenstein coming back saying that everything he said in the tractatus was wrong tractatus was wrong um some people seem to think that they're compatible uh but really uh, it's a very very sharp distinction from the tractatus um essentially what he's trying to say is that like concepts function in a way and, and this is also peter geach um there's a great book if anyone's interested in it um called uh mental acts and their objects it's like a really thin book um it's like philosophy of mind it's it's, it's interesting stuff um it's not easy but it's it's interesting uh, and he talks about why abstractionism, as in, um, you know, for example, if I look at a wall and I see that it's white, uh, I gain the co concept of whiteness is actually inadequate to explain how language and conceptualization functions. Uh, and that it's actually more adequate to say that I actually create the concept of whiteness and apply it to the wall um, and, and, and the, uh, the, you know, and the color um, and for it to function logically as it does. Um, now, well, wait, let's go back to what you said. Like I can do science in all conceptualization with no reference to any other human being ever. Like there, there was at one point, one mind, one consciousness that exists in the universe. And it started this whole process of making associations. You don't need other minds to do that. You don't need other minds to form a language. You no, don't need other minds to do so any of that. Are you arguing for God there? No, I'm just being like a single organism that the first brain that ever existed in the world but wait a minute, what, what, wait, we'll get onto that in a second. Um, because you said, you said you like, needed reference to other people to make sense of like how we... Physical reality or, or, or reality as a whole, ontological reality. Right, yeah. and so I'm saying you don't. You, if there was a, at one point, there is a single brain in the universe and it was doing all of this stuff without any other brains. Like you don't need reference to any other human being. Like, there, there, are many, there are many cases what? where there is a single human being who lives like in a forest on their own or who's was like abandoned and their brain is working just fine to make these associations without reference to any other human beings. You don't need that at all to do science. You don't need it at all. Like, to do they're not incapable of inducing a concept. I'm just saying they're incapable of understanding their own concept. They're incapable of forming uh, deductive arguments is what I'm saying. What? Like that makes no sense. I'll, I'll explain in a sec. So like um, the whole point of what I was referring to is um, a guy called Wittgenstein. And the reason I was referring to him is because he argues that language cannot be private. So right, the ability... private language argument, but that's wrong. It's not wrong. It is definitely Why wrong. Do you think it's wrong. Why do you think it's wrong? Because you can make a private language all you want. Like all you have to do is reference objects. Like I, I can say that as bleh, 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 bleh. And it's, it's Yeah. Fine. And then what holds, but what's the private language argument arguing? that the the reference to what you're speaking can't have meaning without it being able to be conveyed to other people Something like that it's not but what it well kind of but like i think that like it's overly simplified so the the, uh. the
<laughs> but like essentially what it's actually saying is that that uh grammar um that the linguistic fa- framework of something like english russian whatever it may be is, is actually holding our conceptualizations in between multiple minds so that we can have a referential point in which we go it, like um if i go blur and i point at that object and then i go blur and point at that object or i go uh you know that's a cat and that's a cat and they're two separate objects that have no ontological similarities, for example, but I've forgotten, for example, that, that I said it about the other object, I would be incapable of knowing which or which, which was not a cat. I would be, um, it, it, something could be both A and not A at the same time. They both be, um, you know, P and not P at the same time. We cannot hold, um, you run into essentially like, um, uh, you, you, it becomes incoherent because there'll be no, um, there'd be no standard from which to reference of our capacities for conceptualization. The whole point of something being, um, or for, for the private, the whole point of the private language argument and saying that it's impossible to have a private language is to say that it simply could not function in the sense of being coherent. You would be incapable of knowing whether your interpretation of the word was, uh, uh, was um, the same or different to any other point in time, even in the same sentence, because your interpretation of the word would be the standard from which the word was used. They would be both the same. You could never use a word wrong. But so that's, you, that's the same thing as uh, Gödel's and Galen's theorem of logic: is that in any logical system can't be shown to be internally consistent without reference to an external logic. I mean, that's true of all knowledge. You don't need that absolute well, certainty. Well, you would say with logic, it's like what Wittgenstein, I think, does adequately show. And I think what um, even Aristotle kind of points out: it's impossible to think illogically. Logic is a function of our mind it is it simply it, it simply cannot be rejected it, it's it, it you would have to reject logic you would have to reject the very thing from which gives you the concept of being able to reject it you are using well, that, that, it in- that wasn't that wasn't the point i was making so the point i was making is that that same problem applies to logic yet we can still use logic you don't need to have absolute certainty you don't need to have that kind of basis of knowing well, it's not- it's not about absolute certainty in that respect. I understand that, but it's the, it's about the like the logic is necessary, and it's the only logical, it's the only concept that is necessary. I wasn't arguing it's against. Impossible. I wasn't arguing against logic here. My argument is for language. Yeah. Even though the same problem can apply to logic, we don't reject logic. We can use the same reasoning to say even though this problem applies to language, if I'm alone on an island and I use a word to refer to a tree or whatever, even though I can't be certain that the next five seconds I'm using the word to refer to something else, doesn't matter. I can still have some reasonable level of confidence just because of how my brain works. I can still say that the word I used, blah, still refers to the same tree and be reasonably certain that that I'm meaning the same thing just based off my personal experience without any reference to any other person. I don't believe like Okay, but then let's say like you were to develop like a private language, right? And you'd think that, and think about the range of complexity in which you could actually hold these concepts, uh, uh, even even just in pure memory. Uh, you, you would overwhelm yourself quite quickly. At least I know I would overwhelm myself quite quickly. What do you mean? And my ability to, my capacity for uh, remembering its correct application or not would be impossible. So if I say to you, something is analytically true. So for example, um, a bachelor is an unmarried man. How would I know that was the case if I am not able, like the point of it being analytically true is not to say that, um, we have assumed that a bachelor is an unmarried man. What we have actually done is we have identified a bachelor as being an unmarried man. We have shown that they are the same thing, applied concepts and held them in, in a language, in a language game, in which holds the, the usage um, um, the same. Now, if someone comes along and says, a bachelor is a married man, would you say they were wrong? No, it's, they can define it any way they want. They're both right. But then there's no such thing as right and wrong because logic doesn't function anymore. No, no, logic functions just fine. It's just the meaning of the words is different between different people. No, like all deduction then is assumed. There is no, like, there is no rational argumentation that they can go premise A, premise B, premise C, uh, A, A, B, C, and and, then actually show that it functions in that way. It would just be an implicit assumption. I'm not understanding your point here. So lang- language is arbitrary. Any word can mean anything you want it to mean. So if I mean uh, by bachelor an unmarried man and that guy means by bachelor a married man, we can both be right because the language is arbitrary. It doesn't make a difference. Okay, right, okay. Look, like, right. 
but for logic, like we would agree that for logic to function, we we'll have to be able to identify metaphysically separate, like uh, at least nominally, uh, separate objects. Yeah, like A, B, C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then show logical inferences of, like, for example, um, they are not the same object. Uh, they cannot be anything but themselves. You know, they, um, you know, like you'd have to show, like, you know, the law of identity maybe the law of non-contradiction depending upon like your interpretation of it uh and, and so on you'd be happy with that yeah i think so i'm not so sure. if i was to say that um so if i was to, to try and make an argument and i was to say that um like uh at one point like um uh all swans are black right and uh that's a black swan therefore uh was it like all swans are black um like um uh, i don't know uh, i really like the color black therefore i really like swans or something i don't know does anyway like i, I should have just went with the socrates as a, a man one day you know like yeah. but whatever right um if i was to say that right i'm relying upon a, a level of deduction in which the words actually in each premise correspond to the same object in which i go uh, the, that the word swan and swan and the word black and black, no matter who reads this argument, it would flow the same because it, it shows a yeah, logical... Yeah, you, you want to use the words to mean the same thing in each sentence. Yeah. And if they don't, then it wouldn't function. Yeah, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be an argument. It would just be PQR. Yeah, exactly. And that means that language has to be held constant because if it wasn't, then anyone who reads it would interpret it separately without without any like there would be no way for right. them to hold it constant right yeah? so if language is continued meaning to continue change in no, well, language can change but the grammar would have to change with it like for example you could have a a, a, a language community evolving over time that's fine so but for example just be... like we could have the word the word gay if we said it in the 1920s uh, we said uh that man is gay um and conclude he is therefore homosexual that that sentence would not make sense to someone in like the 1850s because then the word 1850s gay meant happy not homosexual yeah, i agree so, no, so language because they're from a different language community right so so language does change that's not a problem the fact that yeah, language, language can change, change it, it can be relative and change within a community but it cannot be individualistic and change within a person's mind because if it was dependent upon their interpretation they wouldn't be able to show whether their interpretation was actually correct or not there'll be no way to verify or falsify whether their reasoning was functioning adequately or not. Right. So, so like I'm, everyone I'm just... would be capable of asserting the truth with equal merit uh, uh, upon, uh, upon a claim, regardless of evidence. Right. So, so I can just, again, so logic is a language that describes reality. Reality exists prior to logic. So when I say uh, I that, say. that is bleh or whatever, that tree is bleh. And I, I five minutes later, I come black and say, Oh, look, it's bleh. I'm assuming that I mean the same thing by the words. But I don't need to know with absolute certainty that I do. I can just assume that they mean the same thing, and I still so justify it. absolute certainty, and even having the possibility of of verification or falsification. If it's unfalsifiable that you are using the word adequately, then this is so. There would be no way of of even asserting that you are using the word right because you would be referencing only your consciousness in a given moment, right now, at each point. You'd be like you wouldn't even like. So, for example, if I walk past the tree and I go, like, tree, and then I walk, come back and I go, tree, and the tree is a private word that I've made up and not something held constant within English or Russian or whatever the hell language we want to put it in, um, then in each each scenario, um, all I'm doing is pointing at, a, pointing at a, 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 an object and naming it tree because the the standard doesn't exist. It's simply my consciousness which is i'm relying upon myself to hold it hold it still it becomes subjective truth it's, then it's still subjective. subjective it's still subjective even in, in a larger culture with lots of people it's just contingent on the group instead could, of the individual could, could but you not see how truth would be subjective in this scenario in terms of if we're no, 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 I'm saying the same thing applies to the society the number of consciousnesses make no difference to the argument it's always going to be like we don't know with absolute certainty that it is going to be the case. It's always that. That's what we rely upon is probability, right? Yes. So there's not a problem there. There isn't a problem there. I can be alone and call that tree and then be confident that it's still tree when I come back. That's perfectly reasonable. I have no issues there. There's no logical problem there, even if I don't have absolute certainty in that case, or I, what I call absolute certainty. You don't need that. 
what, what you're talking about isn't the problem. Like, yes, yes, you're right. I can't be certain or I, but I can be reasonably confident that when I come back and say tree, even though that's just a word I made up in my head, it still refers to the same thing. I can still have confidence in that, even though Wouldn't I can't you need to know whether you're using the same bloody. I don't word. need to. I don't need to. I can have confidence. I don't need to but know. The, the, yeah, but your confidence is is irrelevant to the truth. If we yes. were to say the truth is a thing, what you've done is you've destroyed truth. You've made it nope. subjective. No, no, I haven't. That's that's yes, called, it's know. called fallibilism in philosophy. You don't it's no need fallibilism. it is. Infall I'm is. a fallibilist. This is infallibilism. Yes, it is. That's the argument you're making. Is that, oh, you can't oh, have you can't have certainty that what you mean by those is there. Require, That's essentially the argument. Anything. Actually, this would require for this to function the way it does. You'd have to have something more similar to infallibilism, in which I could assert that my definition would remain constant because of my brain holding a constant. That there is a necessary factor in which holds a constant for it to actually function. It would be like this. This way actually destroys the possibility of truth. It's not about like no, it doesn't. It 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 it. it it, it does. It, it does. does not. It, it it's because truth, I, I would the correspondence theory of truth. Truth is that if you if a sentence corresponds to reality, it's true. And so if what you mean by the sentence is that tree and that tree exists and it corresponds to reality, the sentence is true. Yeah, but like the words you use, for example, are universals, right? So if you're using a universal, for example, like tree, um, everything that's not ostensive is a universal pretty much, right? Yeah. So like tree, desk, like chair, whatever applies to, you know, since you're using platonic forms as well, I suppose you agree, like uh, universal concepts or, or forms within reality, right? In which I reference. Well, I'm, very I'm, a, I'm more of an anomalous. I don't think there's any universals, but. Well, so you don't think there's any universals at all? Uh, in reference to language and objects in those kinds of sense, not as much without like several exceptions, like laws of logic, that kind of thing, but that's a different conversation. Okay. So if I was to say a desk, you wouldn't say that was a universal. Um, not necessarily. I'd say how, try to define to me a desk, give me a single definition of desk that can apply to all desks and doesn't exclude any non desks or excludes all non desks, like the chair argument, you know? Mm, yeah, I know, I know, I know the argument. I, I guess the the issue is, is that like, um, and then someone obviously you you try and reference a chair that has like you know, um, postmodernist chairs. Yeah, exactly. This is, but this is this is to def th th this is the whole. But postmodernists don't believe in truth. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah, but, so yeah, I believe in truth. I believe truth it's is that where to place you because you're making quite bold meta narratives well, you don't have to place me anywhere you forget about me just, just you're like nah 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 foundation <laughs> yeah you, you don't you don't need to place me you just need to place the argument so the argument is is that we can have language perfectly coherently fine on our own in an island, secluded island with no other reference of no humans there's no problem with that in fact it's literally happened in history multiple times well like individuals have constructed their own private language and it function not as the same deductively with the language i mean uh, like one I, I don't think that's actually one like uh, i don't know whether it's possible to 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 even to know whether that's true or not without actually finding someone on an island like was i think there was i think chomsky talked about this didn't he, he talked about like the forbidden uh the forbidden experiment kind of thing like the a girl being wild and how it would affect that linguistic development but uh, like I'll, yeah, we have I'll, cases of those there's I'll, actually I'll, one in russia I'll, where there was I'll, actually I'll, that happened I'll, I'll, I'll go so far to, to argue that your ability, if you were to put a child in the wild, uh, I don't think they would develop self-consciousness, self-awareness in the way that we we, uh, we, we function right now. Develop uh, self-awareness? Like, because for me, self-awareness yeah, is just conscious experience. So that's what I mean by self-awareness. What do you mean? I mean, self-awareness is being aware of oneself through time, psychological continuity, the ability to refer to oneself as an I, an object of one's own experience. Right. So we would definitely have less cognitive abilities because we have lots of tools that we get from other uses of language that we wouldn't otherwise have that definitely make more associations in the brain. But those came from somewhere. They had to have developed in human history from an individual with a brain. They couldn't like just have there's in your system where it requires multiple brains to have essentially adopted these things at the same time and refer to themselves in order to come up with the concepts, then it's impossible for them to have ever come about if there was a first like, brain. To, to say that the first words were birthed out of induction is fine. Like they were just induced a poof out of nowhere. That's fine. Like I get it. Like like the first ever words, like someone just went Bleh! like slap. Like uh, Wittgenstein actually gives the, the, the this at the start of his uh, of the start of the philosophical investigations actually, and he's just like someone just says slab and just points at a rock. You know what does that mean? And he starts talking about how the different interpretations of the other tribes people and trying to work out whether they mean the the, the same thing and. Uh, and all these different things, like talk about numbers and the development of numerical systems and and uh, the basic alphabet and shit like that. Like, I get it, right? Like, it, it would be out of nowhere. Someone just goes, 
like that, you know, like they make a noise, a click or whatever it may be. And then the point towards ostensibly towards an object. Uh, and then you have a referential point for the other individual to pick up and then they would then run with it. The point is, is that obviously each of our brains think logically, uh, at least uh, rationally in the sense that we all are incapable of thinking of something of being A and not A simultaneously in terms of the laws of logic actually all function within our minds. I, I don't think either of us disagree with that, do they? I don't we? think so. Um, okay, cool. So, so, right. so go, go, back, go back to your original example. Like if we have someone in the forest and hears a noise like uh, a branch falling or whatever, and that branch has a fruit on it or whatever, and he eats the fruit, and then he associates that sound of the branch falling to the fruit, and then anytime he hears that sound or makes like tries to replicate it, then he has now has a private language of that cracking noise or whatever means food. And so anytime you hear that cracking noise, you're going to think of food. And so now he has a private language with no one else. No one else is referenced here. He's just associating the sound to the sensation of food. And that's perfectly fine. I mean, like, I mean, like there's a bell ringing, like if like Pavlov's dogs, I don't think that's a language. I wouldn't say that, that, that the dogs have developed a language if they salivate, um, even if it was a conscious realization that they should run through. That's what uh, language that's is. That's all how language all formulated in human beings well, is that they associated... Language is able to, for example, you could not ring a bell and it and various forms of bells and then it turn it into deduction. Like language has to has to like for for deduction and 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 uh, verification and falsification to function, um, we require we require other agents who are able to understand these things at the same standard as ourselves and for us to be able to understand these things in the future to exactly the same standard so that we can hold. Uh, a notion of like truth is required to be constant it's required to be held constant if it was constantly developing in the sense uh constantly um what's what would be the best word like um like a self-deforming cast like something that is constantly in flux it wouldn't be truth anymore if it was to be it, it can change it can develop and it can grow and we can find that we were wrong and that there are new things that are right and you know we can develop that's fair enough we can start off with inductive like blah uh and then you know like that's blah that's not blah and then you know we can create inferences from that because of the way our minds work um in terms of like together and then we can have conceptual growth from that so if you if someone let's say you pointed out a tree and went blah right and what you meant was that all trees are blah and then somebody else pointed out a tree and went blah they get that they mean trees are blah but then later on you point out a bush and you go blah, right? Because you don't differentiate the metaphysical differences between a bush and a tree, right? But the other people in the tribe go not blah, right? Conceptual growth occurs within you when you when you are forced to when you are forced into uh, recognizing the metaphysical differentiation between a tree and a bush. Right, right. But you can do that without other people. You don't need other people for that. You just need to refer to reality. So, for example, if I say uh tree cracking equals fruit and then i say oh water running equals fruit and i go to the water there's no fruit there and then oh i now have conceptual growth because i associate this sound to fruit and not this sound no, to fruit. not necessarily not necessarily i mean like for one like that's literally could, how language developed in humanity not well i mean that one you, that, that's a pure assertion because we do not know necessarily how language developed in humanity yeah we do we can see it happening in different kinds of uh species of animals with lots of tests that we develop language in animals I, 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 I don't think that we can say that like for example like even if we were to say that like um you know the like in terms of we might be running on different definitions of language as well which is probably causing a, an issue but like if i was to say that like for example someone runs over to a, here's a tree cracking and, and associate where was it like sound uh image association uh i wouldn't call that language but then even if like they had sound image association uh on a really complex scale and there was nothing holding it constant so that it could communicate uh even with itself the meaning, if it cannot hold meaning constant, then, uh, for example, uh, you know, um, this is a rock and understand rock holds a certain thing, and you know, uh, which is relates to one's own experiences and blah, blah, blah. Like, if it could not hold that constant, then I wouldn't say it was a language. If it wasn't able to make sure that the that the meaning was actually mm -hmm. being transmitted. Right. Well, I would agree, but I'm saying there is a way for it to ma maintain the meaning, which is that when it... Direct relation. Yeah, direct sense experience. Like, I can yeah. see the fruit. Or like, Russell. So like Bertrand Russell, uh, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't really care yeah. enough about other people's philosophies oh, to try and research right, into yeah. them. To... So like Bertrand Russell has like he he argues a very similar thing, um, but then in this case, 
um, you also find out probably find some problems with this. So, for example, when a blind man uses the word, um, oh, I, I see what you did there. Say if he says a phrase like, I see what you did there. And the word see actually relates to the capacity for sight. Has the blind man used the word see properly? Has he used it? Only if he used it in coherence with what he means by it, yes. Right. And like, so how would he know that he's used it properly? If he, if what he means by it is what he used it, then yes, then he used it properly. Like, all Do that we, matters is his self-referential thing. If, let's, just, let's just get out of that. What is truth? Truth is whether a sentence corresponds to reality. Correspondence so, to truth. truth. Just, okay. True justified belief, would you say? Like, as in... Uh, that would be evidence. knowledge. Knowledge is... Yeah, that would be knowledge. True justified belief. So, but then to say something was true, if it says it corresponds to reality, yeah. how would you show that it corresponds to reality? Would it just be perceptual? You, that would be how we go about showing it. Like that's indirectly. I think that's for the most case. I would I would agree that truth is primarily perceptual. Okay, and then knowledge would be you would agree it would be true justified belief. Yeah. Yeah. So can he have knowledge of whether he used the word correctly? Uh, that's arbitrary. Like his usage of the word is arbitrary. It's not about reality. So like no, if but I, like, like if I say well, like, he's he's saying the word in reality and he has an intention in reality no like if i say bachelor is an unmarried man that's not true that's just it's it's analytic it's true by definition just because that's happened to be how i used it there isn't a yeah, reference to reality in that case it's just made up this is this is a rock um how would you know that this is a rock like as in like would you know that was right like, if his just, if his sense experience corresponded to the idea in his head that he referred to as rock. Okay, right. And when we say the when we say the words like, you know, a bachelor is an unmarried man, the difference there is essentially the fact that it exists in your mind. That's yeah, there the, is no the... sense experience of a bachelor. Right. Okay. Excellent. And but there is a sense experience of a rock. Yes. Right. And so when someone is unmarried, you don't think that's a physical occurrence, like a like like, so for example, it's conceptual, it happens in reality, but it's something observable and objective. Would you disagree? No, because bachelor and married aren't properties of things in reality. They're abstract properties we apply to things. Well, you can't like, you can't like go to a different okay. universe and then uh, okay. deconstruct a person's body and find the married or unmatchler, the unmarried or bachelor property in them somewhere. It's not a physical property. It's just, it's an abstract label we apply to things like tall and but like yeah but like tall for example references height right? like yeah yeah but, but you could there's no there's no truth to tall tall isn't like that person is tall is true like it's referentially no, true isn't it no it's completely subjective on the individual like tall could be well, I mean, you, could say that it's, you could say that it's subjective in the sense like for example if i was to say um that is a tall tree because most trees that of that uh whatever do not grow that big and you know what you mean by tall is essentially something which is above average height that would be like a physical reality wouldn't it like yeah but again the the concept of tall would be subjective unless you gave like an actual physical property definition of saying tall is exactly yeah, six like feet give, and if it's yeah. seven feet therefore it feeds, meets the criteria of tall then yes then it would have an objective criterion but just saying we disagree on like almost the entire like i, I wasn't expecting this because we actually agree for them almost entirely on morality except well, i thought we did because when you talk about the impositions of will um like i would agree like but i, I would say will is self-determination and then self-determination is only impo only possible oh i had within... a question about that too i wanted to ask like you said that there was this uh other implicit goal in in our desires or whatever like would it be immoral in your worldview to override the implicit goal say i have this implicit goal i want to get rid of it and then just turn it off or something would that be immoral um i don't think there is a way to override um, hypothetical if it was hypothetically be... possible well I, I i don't think that would be like like for example if we were to say like would it be uh, hypothetically possible to override um i don't think it like it, it because in my action I could not help, but like, <laughs> it would be to say that like, I would have to desire not to desire, kill myself, for example. Um, would it be wrong, for example, to not desire anymore? <sighs> the, the, the example I was thinking of was like, imagine we lived in my best of all possible worlds and we knew there was this property of this implicit desire thing that existed. I don't know what it is. And I say, I want to turn that off. I snap my fingers and it gets turned off. 
I don't know what that means, but I think, I think, the, I think the funny thing is, is that you, like this is like your your entire like I'm, we're going to get on of this in a second because I think you make a very similar error to Kant in a very different way. Well, at least I'm in um, good company. I'm, I'm, I like. Yeah, that's the thing. At least it's like it's it's. it's but and utilitarianism do, does it too. So it, it, it's it's the abstract universal. Like yeah, like the, there's no referential point in which like you can say something is foundationally good. Like you'd have to be able to show that it is good necessarily, and that it is, and like you you're kind of axiomatically imp, uh, uh, um, um, implying a notion of goodness without. Well, again, my, my notion of goodness is purely synthetic. I think goodness is an object in the world and we're just referring to that object. So I'm then not using... To, yeah, but like when you feel like we're referring to that object and you're saying like we intuitionally know that ob like it, the, there's no, it would be like... Um, yeah, I can't, we can't prove it exists. Is, ...is the way morality functions. Yeah, we don't, we don't have any proof that it exists. It's purely a hypothetical object like a physics wimp, weakly interactive massive particle. We can't demonstrate it exists. It's just a mathematical object right now. Or just yeah. look at the math and say, there's this thing. It could exist. That's it. But then, like, we're not making assumptions when we say, like, uh, like ontologically good is the imposition, is uh, to avoid imposition of will. It's not just a, like a... Just that would be just a description of the object. That's it. So I'm... How is that a description of, if it's, like, the platonic good, for example, it's a, you like, for example, it's, um... It's perfectly good. Like everything about it is good. It is, and it's observably good. And I cannot help but deny it's good. Then how would you respond to something like G. E. Moore's open-ended argument? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, open question. Well, yeah. Argument. So if you ask what makes it good, I'm saying it's it's literally the physical thing. That object is its nature is good. No, but why why is it that like I, I could go that's good, and then someone go no that's bad. So you could language is arbitrary, but I'm saying that it's a fact of the world. Like if I said the world is round and you said the world is flat, one of us is factually wrong and one of us is factually right. And what makes it factually wrong or right is the reference to reality. So I'm saying that what makes it good is there's some property of reality which is which determines the good. The same property in this in this thing. So we look at murder uh, occurring in the world. Someone's being murdered. It's an imposition of will. You say that imposition of will is wrong. I say it is. Well, I would actually say it was wrong, but let's say someone says it's right. Like, why are you right and they're wrong? Uh, it releases an immoral particle, and we can measure the immoral particle. What? So, so like, <laughs> I, that's it, I'm saying it's a property of the world. There is literally a thing in the world which is moral or immoral, and if okay. you do a moral or immoral action, it releases a moral or immoral particle, so we can know for a fact this is moral or immoral because it releases this particle. Therefore, it doesn't matter what your opinion is. The release of the particle determined by reality determines if it's good or bad. Your opinion doesn't matter anymore. Just like if I said the world right. is round or world okay. is flat. But like, as of yet, what you're relying upon is intuition, right? Yeah, right now I can't demonstrate the particle. The particle is purely hypothetical. That's essentially... Right. And... But just assume, assume we could, assume we could actually demonstrate there is a well, particle. I just well, put a bootstrap in here, right, that ethics exists. Like that, pulling me, put, we're just like just pulling myself up by my bootstraps. We're just hoping it does. It's just an assumption. Oh, it's a right. hypothetical. So it's it's not an assumption. It's like saying um, um, M theory is true. Like we don't know if M theory is true. String theory, uh, we don't know if the many worlds is true. Know, like for example, we would say that given the evidence, there is no, a good amount. There is zero good. evidence for any of these things. They're purely hypothetical mathematical constructs. There, there, there's no yeah, evidence. Mathematical like, means analytically, like as in like there is like given the amount of like what could possibly be true, this is a, a variant possibility, right? Well, and no, it's, so, so it's... Or even probability. Physics isn't an analytic truth. Physics is all synthetic. So all of the... the yeah, math... but like I would, I would argue that's something that was uh, theoretic, theoretical uh, using reason, like purely mathematical concepts would be like, well, be a priori synthetic. No, no. So it's not, physics doesn't use pure mathematics. It uses physics. So every, um, well, I would, I would every mathematical that, object in physics corresponds to a discoverable principal particle law in physics. So every one of the things in physics is synthetic. It is a thing that exists that is demonstrated to exist. And you're only allowed mm -hmm. to combine those in different ways. There's no pure analytic math in physics. Yeah, but then if we extrapolate from those things to... Um... You combine them in different ways to create new hypotheticals. Yeah, let's just, let's just say like that. Let's just run with that. So we'll combine them in different ways to create new hypotheticals. Um, there would only be like a certain number of possibilities and some would be more possible than others because they would explain more things, right? No. Do you agree? That's, that's so they, the difference. There's there's infinitely many different ways to combine them as far as I know, because you could just you could add like 
just add the things, the equations, like oh, add one, 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 one. It's missed the original. Like, no, no, no. So I mean, like you take uh, a theory, for example, the multiverse theory is combining two different equations in physics, which is the early universe um, inflation, goose early universe inflation, and vacuum states in empty space. It takes those equations and it puts them together to create the multiverse theory. That's what the multiverse theory is. But you can take those and then you just take another equation and add to it and take another equation and add to it, another equation and add to it, another particle add to it. And you can just take all of the different verified laws, principles, and particles and combine them in many different ways to create, like, and just add, keep adding random ones or just keep adding the same one multiple times in different ways to get just infinitely many possible mathematical theories of the universe. They, like, all of the theories in quantum mechanics explain everything. Like, M theory literally explains everything. There is no prediction that could be made that could not be confirmed by M theory. It makes every prediction possible. It says literally anything that could happen can happen. Um, it's like a square circle existing, yeah. and it would be fine. Yeah. So there, so there's so infinitely that, well, many. Square circle, like, no, 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 yeah. no, it doesn't. Yeah. No, it no, doesn't. It does. it because does. Because a square circle, a square circle is not something that's possible. That's what that's, I would that's, say. That's that's um, yeah, that's yeah. Well, well, different, 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 different topic. topic. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. look at. <laughs> Paraconsistent logic, it is possible that there is a square circle. Possible that there's a universe with two plus two plus five. Um, In which is, you'd have to assert that logic could, like, it, that something could not... Uh, paraconsistent logic. Paraconsistent be, logic where there's true logical contradictions. Yeah. I would so, say that there is, there is no possibility of... that. One, it would be it would be impossible for us to know about. For, so its assertion would be beyond human comprehension. Um, and then I would say that it would... Uh, that the assertion itself is ungrounded because it it seems to reject uh, the necessitation law within modal logic, which implies the, the that it could happen. So that, that there is a possibility that that logic actually functions. Yeah, so, so paraconsistent logic is a thing. There are definitely different versions of logic that do adopt that. Dilithiosal logic is a thing, um, but that's a different topic. I tend to agree that I don't think that we should, standard logic is good, but that's a different topic. So the point is, is that there's infinitely many different ways we can construct physical theories. They all make the exact same predictions. There isn't, the, the, the ways to assess which ones are better right now is does it make testable predictions which are confirmed? If so, then it wins automatically. None of them do, so we don't have a preference that way. And so the way we assess them right now is which one's the simplest. That's essentially which one's the most mathematically elegant. And that's not really an accepted metric. So right now there is no consensus on which of these is the best. We're just, here's a bunch of theories. Pick whichever one you like. That's that's the consensus. The yeah, same thing... Worry. Empirical verification. Yeah, because we're we're, look, we're looking for yeah. empirical verification. We don't have it, so they're all just hypotheticals right now. And my model we'll of morality. Oh yeah. What? So if someone like extrapolates, like for example, it's not just like from what I'm aware. Like I don't think they just sandwich maths together willy nilly and just be like, oh, I don't know if it works or not, but whatever. They try and actually work out whether the maths is actually able to function, like in terms of like against the physical universe. Like if if for example something that like. Uh, if they did the maths wrong, they would be able to show that the maths was inadequate. Like, as in, like, you could you could be wrong in the way in which you do maths, even in physics, right? Like, you could create a theory which is mathematically wrong, yeah? Uh, yes, well, sort of. So what they do is they take the observations we have in quantum mechanics and physics and then create a mathematical system to, that can describe those. And it doesn't matter what else it can describe. If it can also allow for a square circle, that's fine. As long as it can explain the stuff we see, then it's fine. Okay, I mean, we'll, we'll get on. But, but yeah, on. it's a different topic. So, so how it relates to my morality is the same kind of thing as I'm looking at the evidence, moral intuition, moral progress. What can explain these? It can be explained purely as a psychological phenomenon we made up through evolution, or it could be explained by a platonic object, or it could be explained by this abstract ideal of the best of all possible worlds. It can be explained by all of those different things. They're all hypotheticals. We don't know the answer yet. It's not a solved problem in philosophy. We just have a bunch of hypothetical solutions. Can so like, like just out of curiosity, why would it for why would we come to the conclusion that the, so with your theory that it's the imposition of will, that's just like a shot in the dark given what we know, yeah? They all are, yeah. They're all right. different hypothetical solutions. Okay, and they're all hypothetical solutions. And so we have no real, there is no real grounding for that. Well, there is grounding. It's simply an unver... Here's the thing. Yeah, we have Thanks. bad evidence. We have terrible evidence. We don't know what the answer is. A bunch of people are just hypothetically positing different solutions for what objective morality is. Really, all you have to go off this is that like, and, and the, the jump is pretty big, that you... Yeah, that you're absolutely right. Is act as if morality is a thing. Uh, well, it's moral intuition and moral progress. So it's, it's not, yeah, so moral intuition would be, let's say moral sense, which is like primarily like what, like a, a mixture of like maybe emotion, 
Yeah, it's purely uh, emotion. It's just I feel that is bad when I see it, and that's it. It's just emotion. Okay, so if someone says like, oh, like, oh, I feel that there's something like bad here, y your hypothesis is to say rather than that saying that like, um, uh, and and the fact that these that these motions can contradict each other, the fact that there is an like, an incredible amount of like it can't it can't really explain. So if I was to have empathy and someone wasn't, if I if I was to, um, you know, um, like you know, let's say someone was to have like a drive to hurt someone and somebody else didn't, uh, and or or let's say somebody else wants to be dominated and lose their will in terms of they and I know you could say that they're desiring it's still their desire. I know the paradox. It's actually like you can't desire not to desire. I don't know. I, I, I would actually go a different. Way. I'd say if you desire to lose your desire and become a perfect slave, then it would be moral to allow you to do that. Right, but then wait, right? Because <laughs> right, I'm sorry, I'm just in paradox right now. Right, um, but yeah. So, right. so the the only evidence for morality is moral intuition and moral progress, which is crappy evidence. We don't have much to go off of there. And this, we you were hyp hypothetically um, postulating that and it that the will is what we should maximize the like, volition yes and that's what most and, and we do and we assume that that's what what most people would consider to be good i don't care what most people do I, i'm just looking at the evidence oh, it actually would be good right yeah okay and of course we shouldn't believe this just because i say it like that's that's not a good basis my i then use this as a model to I make testable predictions there. <laughs> if I'm honest. So, so 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 I take I make a hypothetical solution to what objective morality is. I make testable predictions, and then we see if the testable predictions are true, and then that would be a reason to believe it. Okay, and the testable predictions um, based off this v version being good would be whether people intuitively agree whether it's good or not. No, it'd be like in the future, our moral intuitions we're going to see rocks as falling on people as immoral. That's like one of my predictions. Yeah, but like, but like right now, like what perceptual like what way of perceiving the good is intuition yeah yeah so you would have to be able to say that the good was something perceivable outside of intuition otherwise you'd be relying upon intuition as verification yeah or falsification no the verification is what our intuition will be in the future so i can make a prediction about how it's going to change so even if it is the what we're but verifying then could also be explained through psychology like possibly like even yes, second yes it could be explained through this like that like of, yep, of, like yep. loads of other things problem of underdetermination every single theory every single discovery can always be explained by any theory no matter what the reason we accept one over the other is that if it can make the testable predictions first it wins see i disagree i think that we trust one over the, over the other because we're able to show that it answers more questions than the other which is why something like and i you know relativity overtook uh, uh absolutely not Absolutely. No, so, so God did it can explain literally everything, but it, the fact that it can explain everything doesn't mean it's good. It's not no, about... I agree. I agree that, but it, it came first, right? <laughs> like, no, no, it, and it's, then... whichever one makes the testable predictions first wins. That's how science progresses. Like, it's the belief of that time, if you mean by win. Uh, which... I, mean, no, I, I thought you said uh, testable predictions, right? So they were not counting God in testable, yeah. No, God is testable. Like, like okay. I believe in God. And God's going to make a gold brick. I pray to God. Okay. No gold brick. Damn it. Testable. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. So, so and you'd say that like the the fact that God cannot answer those testable predictions is why it's lost. Well, no. So it's that God makes no success, successful testable predictions. If you could make a successful testable prediction and attribute it to God, and it worked because consistently, that God explains everything. Right, God can explain everything. You can post hoc explain everything, but you can't future infer things. That's the yeah. Difference. I would agree. I would agree. Yeah, unless you just say that, like, uh, like you know, the will of God is, you know, it's uh, the the will of God is to like do whatever. So like, but it'd have to be like uh, predictable, like Newtonian physics predicting the bodily movements of the planets, kind of predictable. I get you. Yeah, you have to predict something we uh, don't know yet, and if you could do that, that would be evidence of God. Um. Right, and so. It's predictable because it can be shown to be deductively true, as in like, I, like if A then B, like kind of like. That would just be a like, different way to uh, make to be the inf prediction. Inferentially, like flaw, as if to go like you know, because if if the universe is like this, then this will happen. 
uh, if that does happen, then I have, um, you know, I have synthetic evidence to say that that logical inference was in fact well, the right. Logical, the, the logical inference is just a different way to describe the causal relation. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I get you. Yeah, I agree. Okay. And we would say that, let's say, because um, I don't think we're actually disagreeing on this. Um, so if we were to say that, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity, I'd say that that is able to make greater predictions, answer more questions, and uh, answer more questions or provide more answers towards these, or like of why, like, like for, when I say answers more questions, I'd say like, for example, um, you know, uh, like, um, there's a list of past data and it can explain more of the past data than the current theory. So there's lots of different things that are yeah, on the table it, to explain. It, it, yeah. Yeah. It can, it can explain the same and more in terms of predictability. It's capable of predicting the same and more was what makes the, the theory better. Yeah. Well, I'd make a distinction between explaining past data and predictability. Those are two different things. So explaining past data is post hoc reasoning. It's uh, I forget what the actual scientific term is. I have it saved somewhere, but it's not the same as predictability. Predictability is the fact that you can use it to answer things we don't know yet, as opposed to just yeah. explaining things we do know already. Yeah, I would I would agree. But then, like for example, like uh, the greater predictability would be something that that would be the the function of the theory, showing that it is functionally more capable than another theory if it has greater predictability. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll agree on that, right? And that, that, like, that would be why like relativity overtook Newtonian physics. Right, because it could make predictions about the curvature of the sun that were more accurate than Newtonian mechanics. And if it right. failed to answer the same things Newtonian physics did in the same, in the same thing that like, um, um, in terms of like, let's say the, the way that uh, the bodily planets moved, it would also like, for example, if it failed to make those predictions, it would be seen as... Um, it would, it would only apply to the light bending around the sun or something. So it would say it would only work in these cases to these specific things. It wouldn't apply yeah. to these other things. Okay. Well, I actually agree. Right. That's fine. And th th that's great. Like we're actually on the right track there. So, and you would say that the reason that, like, I would say that would, that predictability, that ability to, that, 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 that like, um, that predictability, to say that it is capable of greater overall predictions, it's a better theory, is to say that it is, giving us more information which can be shown to be accurate against reality like you would agree yeah yeah i think so okay you're right cool and the way that we show that is more accurate is by reason is by reasoning and no by reference to the world it's always the sense reference to the world the reasoning doesn't mean a damn thing the reasoning is just a, a language to express the reference to the world so if we were all having like let's say let's say like i don't know let's say like um five of us were hallucinating and five of us weren't truth then becomes unknowable for you yeah it it yeah we couldn't tell the difference we would just but what what if i was to say that like if i was to give someone an argument and go right okay but given the circumstances of your like a rational argument given the circumstances of your perceptual data uh, and i cause them to doubt their perceptual data and they were to um um they were able to work out whether it was possible or not that they like, or probable that uh, there was a dragon in front of them and they were to say actually that like this dragon in fact does not exist even though five of us are hallucinating i think it was those mushrooms we ate before from that random like guy or something i don't think mushrooms actually make you see dragons but whatever let's just imagine they did like they totally to say, do like you know I've, I've had those uh, kind of mushrooms. they would be able to reason themselves out of that let's say uh predicament no so you couldn't ever use a rational argument to try to disprove a sense experience like you need a different sense experience you need some kind of other sense experience to override the other the first experience i'm not saying it disproves the experience like it doesn't disprove them having the experience it disproves right. their um prediction of real of their of their conclusion of reality right no you well, can never use an analytic truth to disprove a synthetic experience you, you'd have to have a, just a different synthetic evidence there to disprove it no 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 i disagree i think you can rely upon the experience of the other and i think that's why peer review functions because otherwise, right, the, right. Like, so, so that would be two two synthetic experiences, um, and you're comparing the different synthetic qualities of those. But you could never just use the analytic well, the argument. Is you are comparing are uh, aspects of common experience. You're looking for the commonalities, and you're saying that this is most probably true because they are common in both experiences. I'm not following what you're saying here. So, like, so if, if we if, if we have two people, if we have a telescope, right? Yeah, and they see. Um, 
like you know like stars in the sky like i don't know like alpha centauri and they're like oh that's alpha centauri it's right there that's great and then one guy looks in the telescope and goes nah it's not there right we should believe like the 99 out of the 100 because it's more probable that they actually did have the that uh, they because they had the common experience it's more likely that they are correct together well i would say that we should take whichever theory makes testable predictions which are confirmed like is if i predict that well if we look at it now we'll see it as you say is is the form of um is um is a form of um perceptual verification or falsification from the other's experiences right so so again it's it's about future things so it's not past things like we can past explain both experiences in lots of different ways but we're going to accept whichever one makes the future predictions correctly so if the future predictions we say if we all look and see it or if one hypothesis says we will look and see it in the future and one hypothesis says we will look and not see it in the future and we look and we don't see it then that theory is the one that's right it doesn't matter how many people accept it if only one person oh, wait, wait, says okay. But then, like, so would it be equally true? So, for example, the person who looks and doesn't see it, is it not true for them? I don't know what you mean. So, so if they don't see it, if they simply, like, they, they look for the prediction, right? Like, they, they perceptually, for example, are unaware or incapable of um, seeing it for whatever reason. Is Are they wrong for rejecting the theory or no. are they right for... They're right, right for rejecting the theory. If they can't reproduce it and they're trying to do the experiments and they can't get the results what that are said to be there. What if like almost everyone else was 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 able to reproduce it? No, they, they, wouldn't, were. they wouldn't be reasonable to accept it just because everyone else does. It would still be reasonable to say, I can't get the results. So what? So you would say that it would be, so unless, so why should I trust the, for example, um, the predictions of, of anyone else? In terms of, for example, physics, why should I trust any of physics? Because I don't really participate that much in the field. Uh, I'm just, I'm just because you observer. don't really participate that much in the field and you can't reproduce the experiments or they can. Like right, yeah, could, but they've could... reproduced them in front of me, so my perceptual data is not being explained. No, if you could reproduce the experiments and don't get the results, then it would be unreasonable for you to accept the hypothesis. But if you can't or you, you don't have the capability and you realize their capability is better, then it's reasonable to just accept what they're reasonable. doing. So what we're doing is based on reason, reasonable. Like what's reasonable or not? Yeah, reasonability. What you believe is based on reasonability. That's true. So, like, so, so, if I was to say that, like, um, it's reasonable to say that I'm just doing the experiment wrong, or it's reasonable to say that I'm, um, doing it, or I'm incapable of seeing it, or it's reasonable to say that I may be making a mistake yeah. that other people are not making. Definitely. I should. I should. I should uh, uh, yeah. I should accept their perceptual data and not mine. Definitely. Okay. In which case, like. You, you don't think that like if it's direct relation to reality in my perception of relational reality then why is it that reason has allowed me to, def to define my own perceptual relation to reality because you use reason to show that your sense experience could be flawed from other sense experience you say i have a sense experience reason to show that this sense experience may not be correct now if you if you do the experiment correctly and you have good sense experience reason to believe you've done the experiment correctly and you don't get the results then you have reason to doubt everyone else's position right Okay, I, I, I think the, but the reason you can always, the reason isn't what's important. The reason is just it, describing the sense experience. Reason reason is a matter of probability about one's experiences, right? Like, and and I, I think we probably do need to have a conversation about whether um uh, whether empiricism is a, a sense sense um because you you reject sense certainty. I'm assuming, yeah, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. So like you're a fallibilist, you reject sense certainty, um. And what you would say is that um, it would be probabilistic, yeah? yeah? Probabilistic relation, okay. And have you ever, like, if I had a, known that we're going to debate, we probably should do another debate on empiricism. Well, I'm not, like, an, I'm not saying empiricism is the only way to gain knowledge. It's only the way to gain knowledge about reality, independent of definitional truths, synthetic truths. I, I, well, I mean, like, the thing is with analytical...